So it's been a while I haven't done a video. I've been doing written um, posts because um, I've been told that they seem to be more useful. But today I'm going to do a video and in this video I'm going to explore the case put forward by Hume and Maurice Wilds against miracles and then we're going to look at some of the responses to them. So let's start with David Hume. Well, he was a skeptic, an atheist, he didn't believe in the divine, all his knowledge comes from science and sensory experience, he was an empiricist. So, what he says is that there isn't a direct cause and effect relationship. It isn't that I let go of this pen and it will drop to the ground. What is basically happened is that there are laws of nature, like gravity, which are absolute and they are regular and they are unchanging. And because of this consistency in the laws of nature, from my experience, we know that when you let go, we know when I let go of this pen, it will drop to the ground. That's from experience, we can tell that. So the cause and effect relationship is founded upon the absoluteness of natural laws that we have experienced from the past. So, and that, so that's what he says about cause and effect. Now, how does this apply to miracles? Well, he says that like, a pen dropping to the ground. What is the evidence for me to say that this pen will drop to the ground? Well, past experiences, laws of nature, etc. For a miracle, what is the um, uh, evidence that a miracle has occurred? Because remember, a miracle is a violation of a law of nature, according to um, Hume. So what is the evidence for it? He says testimonies. And he said the chance of these testimonies being correct is much less that the laws of nature are wrong. So let's put it another way. So the chance that uh, a miracle has happened, this pen has gone up, is much less than the chance that what the person is saying is actually incorrect, the person was hallucinating, deluded. Those are more likely reasons for this account. So therefore concluding that miracles are always impossible because there is always going to be a bigger chance that the testimony is incorrect than the laws of nature actually being violated. And I'm going to quote him here, so this is his theoretical case against miracles, and he says, A wise man proportions his belief according to the evidence. So that's, that's his um, uh, case against miracles uh, theoretically um, summed up. So that wasn't just it. He said, if you don't take my word for it, that these miracles don't exist theoretically, then actually there are four practical reasons why they don't exist. And those are, the first is, he says that the witnesses, the people who provide the testimonies, are not educated and they're insane. And that is a very racist to a certain extent and an elitist claim to make, I think. Witnesses are not educated and insane. Sure, there are um, people who are educated and they're sane, um, yet they have miracles. So he's making a big generalisation. The second reason is he said, if you're interested in religion, the divine and all these things, then... You are, you're going to actually create it yourself, the miracle. It's just a psychological event. It's nothing um, big and special. You wanted it, so you've created it in your mind, although there is no proof for this. The third is, he says that miracles only occur in ignorant and barbaric nations. So by this, he means they don't happen in the modern world, you know, where people are more advanced which is not true. The Toronto blessing in 1992 happened in Canada. That's the modern world. That's the Western world. You know, it's incorrect what he's saying, in my opinion. And the last um, reason he gives against miracles is he says that if miracles were true, why isn't there consistency? So why don't all the faiths point to the same thing? Miracles in each faith point to different gods and different beliefs. This just shows that it's a psychological event. It's what people want to see, not that actually exists. However, like William James points out, that religious experience and miracles, they all point towards the divine and the supernatural. Uh, the details are basically unimportant. So that's why his um, practical uh, theory against miracles doesn't work in my opinion. And I've gone through the theoretical case. Now let's look at some of the responses to David Hume. So the first is that what he's saying in terms of miracles is inconsistent with his own writing. He talks about the laws of nature being a psychological event. 
And he says, just because the sun has risen today and has risen in the past doesn't mean it will rise tomorrow. So if laws of nature are just a psychological event, then how can he say that miracles don't exist because they are merely a psychological event? Do you see? There's a contradiction. The second is, um, I've already told you why the practical reasons they don't work, basically. And then Swinburne, he says that... Testimonies are not the only evidence for miracles. There are physical traces. So, for example, Jesus walking on water can be proved by the existence of dry clothes. Or, if you want to look at something, um, there are miracles which have been documented and recorded. Those are all also evidences for uh, miracles. So, the only evidence is not testimonies. And that may... and. If there is more uh, evidence of miracles and testimonies, then his whole theoretical case against miracles basically um, dissipates. St. Augustine, he says that we should accept miracles. They are not within the human understanding to understand miracles. We cannot understand the purpose of them. We cannot understand why they occur, how they occur, or anything. So we should just accept them and put them aside. So I would actually agree with that. I don't think what Hume is saying um, actually makes sense. And I think we should just... You know, except miracles. Flu, however, he agreed on David Hume's uh, work and he built on it. He said that the only direct evidence for miracles for historians would be if they were there in the time, but obviously they're not, so they're relying on secondary accounts and other stuff, which is all indirect evidence. And indirect evidence is insufficient evidence to accept miracles because it's not direct, it's not clear, and yeah, that's just Flew's opinion. And he also says, yeah, so it's only if you are present, then that's evidence for a miracle. So if you were present in a miracle for Flu, you would have had to have a miracle. So he's also kind of contradicting himself. Now, Swinburne also attacks um, the laws of nature that Hume um, goes on about. Because Hume, again, he built on the work of Sir Isaac Newton. He said they're not absolute fixed laws of nature their statistical laws so they just tell us what is probable to happen they don't tell us that this is absolutely going to happen because science is based on theories which are continually being updated so um, he gives example of a parent and a child so a parent has rules for the child so the child must go to sleep this time blah 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 but if the child pleads a lot the parent is willing to bend the rules the same way that God has put the rules, um, laws of nature to us. But if we are pleading to and he feels the need because we are his creation, he loves us after all, he will bend the need and he will occasionally interact with us via miracles. And it can't happen all the time. Miracles cannot occur all the, uh, all the time because that would make the world irregular and we, would be, we wouldn't be able to um, have a consistent life or actually live properly because we don't know when the next miracle is going to occur and also if we relied on God solely then if somebody got cancer we would rely on God to heal it and we wouldn't have made advances in medicine evolution etc etc and then one of his principles um, say that testimonies people tend to tell the truth more than they lie so actually what Hume is saying that testimonies are only from non-educated and insane people is actually incorrect then you have another guy Polkinghorne now he was a theologian and a scientist so he sort of merged the two and he said science can only tell us what um, uh, happens uh, normal expectations so a bit like statistical laws it will only tell us that if a miracle occurs then this is going against the norm but it does not disprove it it's just merely stating it so science can't be used to disprove miracles he says God works through humans and he says therefore affecting the physical process of the world because humans affect the physical process of the world if God is working through us then God is affecting the physical process of the world so miracles can exist. I think the biggest criticism to Hume is to do with science because Hume's work is based on um, Newton's work. And that is that um, scientific laws are absolute and fixed. Einstein, however, came along and he updated and outdated, if you want to say, this work. And he said, no, they're not always fixed. And he said, um, there are many laws of nature that we will not be able to understand because they're not fixed and they have, a uh, they have a changing nature. Quantum 
physics, for example. This is where tiny particles randomly move, cannot be explained through science, there's no consistency. So therefore, miracles are actually scientific events because they, if they violate the laws of nature, then so do science because you can't explain all of science through absolute laws of nature. Dawkins, however, says it's all to do with a psychological event and Peter Atkin, he comes along to support Hume and he says that actually people who have miracles are doing it to seek publicity or deluded or are hallucinating. So Peter Atkin, Flew and Dawkins agree with Hume but the rest don't. Um, I'm not going to do Maurice Wilds in this video, a video, I'll do it in part two because I'm running out of time. Thank you for watching, please visit my blog.